Come to chapter 2 in the club's history. The period under review now is 1946 to 1973. With the war over, but national service still in place and rationing a feature of society, the club began to re-establish itself within the community. In this next phase of our journey, we examine the club's development as a senior club, playing in the unofficial championship, competing in Big Sevens tournaments, and also a change of home ground and the appearance onto the scene of the next major player in the club's de development, Ramsey Smith. In those post-war years, uh, the, the team continued to play at Shire Hog, but they were ambitious back then and Bill cared to the fore as always. In 1948, the club applied for full membership of the Scottish Rugby Union, proposed by Melrose and seconded by Stewart's Rugby Club. In May 1948, the announcement was made that the club had been granted entry into the Scottish Rugby Union the 56th club in Scotland. On the playing front, the years 46 to 51 were notable for the club's performances in sevens. They actually won the Murrayfield sevens in 1949 in front of 10,000 spectators. In the team that very day was a young A.R. Smith who would become even more influential over the next 50 years. Oh, Ramsey was excellent. Ramsey, Ramsey was a good rugby tactician. Ramsey, was like, uh, Ramsey could read a game and he could, could control it. He, he saw it, he was, he, he was a good rugby brain, played for years, and he, also he was an excellent scum. I knew Ramsey well because we'd been in the scouts together and I remember him at school too. I was captain of the school rugby team 1944-45. Ramsey was the scrum half then. He was, I think he was one or two classes below me. But Ramsey was one of these people like Bill Caird that the rugby club owes its continual uh, being to. They, 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 were, they were the links right through. And people like Ramsey kept clubs going. Uh, a great, good player and a good rugby thinker. We made our way up to Inverness Cemetery to this grave here, which unfortunately records the death of John Stewart, who was a result of an injury playing rugby football, who died on the 6th of December 1948. John was a player for the first who, after the game in Glasgow and suffering a neck injury, went home but unfortunately it got worse over the next couple of days and unfortunately, as we can see, passed away. The club did its best at the time to support the family, even holding a game against the Coptimus on New Year's Day 1949. As far as we are aware, this is the only death of a player in the 100 years of Musselboro Rugby Club. And I just heard about it that Saturday night that uh, John Stewart had broken his neck. Free, an absolute freak accident, because his father had died too was in, a, in an accident, I think. And I'd always felt sorry for Bill Kaye having to go back that Saturday night and, and tell Mrs Stewart about her son. Around 1948, Bill Kaye and the committee we're looking at Shire Hawk saying this is not good enough and we're looking for options where to move to. Around that time Inverness Paper Mill owned the community centre across here. They were finding the costs of running the community centre quite prohibitive and were looking to offload this. Bill Kerr saw the opportunity for the club to use this area as their new pitch. At the time of course this pitch had been used for storing heavy goods vehicles during the war and there were sleepers all over the place, big railway sleepers. Also it was a storage spot for Esperato grass, uh, which the paper mill was using. So you can imagine the condition of this area was indeed very poor. However, undaunted, 
Bull and the committee negotiated a 20 year lease on the pitch from 1951 through to 1971 and the area that they got was from in front of the community centre there all the way around to the area where the new clubhouse would be built eventually back down to where the new road is and out to the far reaches of the green area. They could not get a lease right up to the community centre as access was required to allow the caravan club to use the area at the bottom of the pitch during the summer. The caravan club income actually was very valuable as this helped pay for the upkeep of all the facilities. The community centre continued to be used for the wider community. However, Bill Caird again and the committee managed to negotiate that the club would have use of the changing rooms to the right hand side here on Tuesdays, Thursdays and every Saturday. Following the work in 1950, the club eventually moved to Stony Hill in 1951 and played its first match in September 1951 on the pitch versus the Edinburgh and District Union. The first recollections of Stony Hill were uh, in 1951 when we, the first 15 started to play up here. Uh, I was up for the, the first match uh, of that era and the, the great players at that time uh, were the Taylor and Naylor and Ramsey Smith as a young scrum half and T Thomas. Uh, they were the prominent uh, three quarters. Uh, the forwards, John Mooney, Jack Ake and John Downey were all stalwart forwards at that time. 1955 will be remembered as the year Sir A.B. King became our president. Sir Alexander was a well-known Glasgow cinema mogul and had many connections across the entertainment sector. Sir A.B. was not witnessed around the club very often, however he did attend a few dinners, uh, but most notably the first round at every dinner was on Sir A.B. King. Sir A.B. King was president of the club from 1955 through to his death in 1973. An interesting feature of 1955 was that the club played a floodlit match at Old Meadow Bank, believed to be the first floodlit rugby match in Scotland. In 1959, the pitches at Pinky became available to the club. It was then decided that they would be used for our lower team fixtures. This allowed us to relinquish Shirehawk, much to the delight of the golf club, after 40 years of valued service. As we enter the 1960s, Musselburgh was still competing in the unofficial championship, generally finishing around mid-table and in 1960, we were actually 19 in that division. And through my connection with the, the Borderers, I started playing with Musselboro, where I met all the, the Musselboro boys, good boys and bad boys. Bill Cranston, George Patterson, we all joined together on the first, first night training. I attended training at Musselboro on the first night of the 1961 season and it so happened that Len Pullman and George Patterson also attended for the first night and we all went into the first team. We played for approximately seven years helping to keep Musselboro in the unofficial championship. Not bad when all the Scottish players played for their club side and West of Scotland and Hoyk had at least four Scottish players in their parks. I remember playing against Hoyk in the early 1960s and they had more than half their team were internationalists and the crowd were getting quite upset when Hoyk didn't even manage to score a point till late in the second half. Uh, better than that though was remembered against uh, Pinky, as uh, Pinky against West of Scotland who had at least six internationalists at the time, including three British Lions, Sandy Brown and the two, uh, Sandy Carmichael and the two Brown brothers. And uh, we actually won that game 19 nothing, much to the consternation of their uh, vaunted pack. Uh, through the 60s, we had 
some very good players, Sal Wurtsworth, Ben Coleman, uh, Rob Brown uh, in the forwards. Ramsey Smith by this time and T Thomas were playing down the club in the seconds. Uh, they, they were 30-ish, but uh, they put in a lot of effort in bringing on young boys in the club. In 60-61, I was made captain. Not the very best of seasons, I'm afraid. The previous season had been a very good season and two or three of the best players had decided to hang up the boots. Uh, so the first part of the season I went round all the houses, knocking on doors, persuading, without success. I just hadn't a clue what a captain was supposed to do, except for winning the toss, deciding to play against the wind, which of course always dropped at half time. But I had read a book. Uh, a book, yes, a book. Danny Craven, who was the South African guru of that time, Danny Craven's book it was, and I had the great support of T Thomas, who took the backs, I took the forwards, and we went along and we had quite a decent, uh, quite a decent season, yes, until February, when Stuarts took 40 plus points off us. And you'll remember in those good old days, a try only scored three points. Well, I joined the club in 1956, played for the 415, played a season and a half. In those days, if you went into the thirds, that was you destined to be in the thirds forevermore. So I jumped to the seconds and then eventually ended up getting a game for the first 15 in 1958 against Trinity Hackies, changed over in the, the community centre upstairs. Yeah. And I was taken aback because the only person I ever spoke to was Big Andrew Watson, a former stalwart of the rugby club. I thought, this will not do for me, you know. <laughs> anyway, in the second half of that season, I managed to force my way into the first and from then on in, it's history. Played up until the 1972-73 season. Yeah, Captain the side, luckily, twice. And we were a good side in these days. Detrimental to what others thought. <laughs> and one of the, the sayings with the forwards was, if it moved, kick it. If it lay still, bury it. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. And... As I say, we were called the donkeys in these days, and we had, our main priority was give the ball back to the, the girls, as we spoke about, in the backs, right. so as they could score the tries. The Often enough, we had to run back and retrieve the ball. <laughs> the Brill Cream Boys. The Brill Cream Boys. The collars turned up, and they went off the field cleaner than what they went on to the field, some of them. <laughs> Oh, you can't remember when did you first uh, play? Well, I first joined the club in 58, 59. And, uh, my first game was, was a midweek game, uh, a collection of second, thirds, and fourths. And I had the uh, misfortune of breaking my collarbone in the very first game, so I had a very good start to my career. <laughs> Fortunately, that was about the, the worst injury I, I received. Uh, uh, it was 60, 61 when I first played for the first 15 against Royal High. It was uh, a week before my 18th birthday. Uh, and I think it was against Graham's Law, who was a Scottish trialist at the time that I played against my first game. So it was a good introduction to first 15 rugby. Uh, and, uh, uh, I got to miss game in 69 when the, the floodlights were open. Uh, although Musselburgh had already played a floodlight game at um, Meadowbank in the early 50s, I think they were the first club in Scotland to play a floodlight game. Uh, it's a Friday night before the, 
the Welsh International at Murrayfield on the Saturday, so there was plenty of Welsh supporters there. A good, a good money earner at the time. Would that be Bill Kerr that was organising these sort of things? Well, I would think so, yes, at, at that time, although I was only in my teens at the time. But Cammy, you were one of the few members of the club to play over three generations. That's right. Yeah. Tell us a bit about no, that. Now. There was one or two, actually, what, my father and myself and, and Gavin, who's now in New Zealand. I think uh, Jimmy Jimison and Ross... And Ross's son, the other ones were Duncan McMillan's family, there's the other ones that I know of. Inevitably, my introduction to the club was through my father, who was by now a committee man along with Bill Hogg to help with the first 15 at Shire Hawk by being ball boy, orange carrier, and youngest supporter. This was no easy task as the changing rooms were located in the grammar school meaning carrying all the kit over Inveres Church Steps and over the river. This was the beginning of the involvement with the club, where I went on to play for 13 years, between 1964 and 1977, and upon retirement went on to play an active role in the administration of the club for many years. Also in 1960, we see the first arrival on the scene of DMG Campbell. Davy was appointed chairperson of the Dances Arrangement Committee, otherwise the social convener. And he, along with Tommy Beaton, put a great deal of effort into this aspect of the club. We had one game in Grangemouth, but this was the seconds. Uh, and after the match, we were all in the local pub with the opposition. And then we all got on the bus to go to Falkirk for the dancing. We had a good sing-song on the way to Falkirk. We got off the bus uh, opposite the, the dance hall, got into the queue, waited till we got to the front, and then there was two bouncers on the door, and they said, you're not getting in, you're all drunk. Now, Ramsey Smith and David Campbell, who were never backwards at coming forward, went to the front to put our case forward that we were now all drunk. This went on for about 10 minutes and then two police cars and a black Mariah arrived. The bouncers said these two are uh, the ringleaders and Ramsey and David were marched into the back of the black Mariah and that was the last we saw them. They were charged with disturbing the peace, uh, spent the night in jail, had to make their own way back to Musselboro on the Sunday morning. I'm sure their wives were well pleased with their excuses when they got home. In 1958, Mrs. Cruden donated the Brunton Cup to be played for annually in our Sevens tournament. In the 60s, Ramsey Smith really took over the running of the club. Sir A.B. King was president only in name, and Ramsey and the rest of the committee, with the excellent help of Eric Anderson controlling the finances, were visionary in their approach to how Stonehill should look. In the early days, they concentrated on raising enough funds towards building the clubhouse. However, an opportunity arose in the late 60s to install floodlights at Stonehill. As we know, Musselburgh played one of the first ever floodlight games and this really galvanised the committee into this modern approach. The Electricity Board had advised the committee that they could run a cable to the side of the pitch here for only £92, which was still a significant amount of money in those days. The switch gear would be stored in the community centre. Pylons were purchased at the cost of around £800. A trench was dug right across the park to the other side, around about the 22 here to allow those pylons on the far side to be created as well. Floodlights were also placed on top of the community centre to allow full coverage of the pitch. Were you involved in the erection of the, the lights, Rob? Uh, no, that was Jimmy Rover who was involved Jimmy in that Rover area. And myself. Aye. And Kelly, and I'm quite well duty being in the post office and climbing poles. Right. Uh, <laughs> I was able to climb, climb the 
finally... And if you ask Jimmy to do anything, he would do it anyway. It didn't matter what. <laughs> After being asked to join the club of Eric Brown when I was an apprentice in Brunton's Wormall, I played for the Colts under Bill Hogg and Jimmy Jimison. Great guys. I then moved on to the third, second and first. At that time, we played the first means that we, we had the opportunity to play against Scottish internationals, which was quite exciting for me. In those days, there were only two open senior clubs in the Edinburgh area. That was Edinburgh Wanderers and Musselburgh. The rest were all FP clubs. George Patterson was then captain of Musselburgh. Ken Speckle figure. Being just out of uni and not having a lot of money, I used to travel to and from Musselburgh by bus until another Ken Speckle figure, Len Pullman, sold me an old banger. I wish I'd stayed on the buses. I was made captain for the 69-70 season and enjoyed every minute of it, particularly because there were no coaches in those days. Hmm. I was fly half and Jimmy Robbery was scrum half. And if I say so myself, I think we made a pretty good partnership. And indeed today, a friends on Facebook. Well, here we are inside the main hall at the community centre. Hasn't changed much in the last 70 years. This would be used by the community, so the rugby club never had sole use of it. But over the years, we've used it effectively. But I just really want to show you the main part of the day, which is the changing room complex. Follow me. And down and through the corridor into these magnificent changing facilities. We're going to go into the, the home changing room first. Here you can see the original coat hooks are still here. 15 players in here on a match day. A coach perhaps. Perhaps getting a stern wigging after the game. But on a training night, 20 to 30 people in here. But if you think that was tight, what about the away changing rooms? Follow me. It's a nice shade of pink now. It wasn't always pink. But I must say, 15 players in here, Musselboro were getting an advantage. And if you thought the changing rooms were bad, what about this for showering facilities? Three shower heads for 30 players. Cramping in, it was a real run to get in. You never knew when the hot water was going to run out. On a training night, 40 players perhaps at any given time trying to get in here. You can see why we needed to build our own changing rooms. Now having a pitch that was worthy of being played on, floodlit as well, Ramsey and his fellow committee members turned their attention to the building of the clubhouse. Funding was required. The club had £5,000 in the kitty and they approached the SRU for a grant. However, the SRU didn't offer a grant, but they offered a loan of £5,000. They also approached Rybrow's Brewery for funding on the premise that they would be able to supply the club with beer when it was built. Drybrows provided a £1,000 grant towards the building. With £11,000 in the kitty, Harry Williams, a member of the club and an architect, drew up plans for the structure as we see it today. Tenders were invited and Dennis of Dalkeith were awarded the contract to build the clubhouse at around the £11,000 cost. Uh, by the end of the 60s, we had enough money to build the clubhouse with, shall we say, a lot of us agreed that if, if the club got into debt, that we would be held responsible. I think I signed up for about £3,000 and I was earning about 1500 a year at that time. Uh, but uh, we got the clubhouse started with the help of a lot of volunteers uh, and we got a contractor uh, to uh, come in and set it up. With the great help of Finlay Whitaker doing the electricals and Ian Fairadure and a team of helpers doing the woodwork and the other elements of the internal design, the clubhouse was ready to open in October 1970. I became the, uh, well when the clubhouse was getting built, 
and we were all involved in it. I volunteered to get onto some committee and some just to do a bit. But I became the first bar convener and uh, effectively chairman of the club house. And that was a hard job, a very hard job, because I knew nothing about the booze business and running a club and running a bar and all that. I had to learn it all. I had to go to the police and speak with them and I sought advice all over the place. The official opening of the clubhouse was on the 6th of February 1971, performed by Mr R. Wilson Shaw, President of the Scottish Rugby Union. I can mind my first game against Musselburgh. It was about 50 years ago, I was 18, and uh, Musselburgh were the better side, but we got a draw in the end. Uh, Graham Hogg tried to drop goal and we got a dry, try in the corner and I missed the kick to win it. And they would have played all day. The referee would have let them go in until Hogg scored in the far corner. Because <laughs> we weren't beating them. Yeah. It was Derek Gray who scored in the corner at the far side. It was wild that day.